This is Chapter 11, Stockholders' Equity. Let's run through a little scenario here about how and why a company would issue stock or ownership in their company. Here we see the president of a company addressing her employees. She says, if we're going to expand to new markets, then we're going to need more financing. But she doesn't want her company to have to pay anyone back by taking out a loan or incurring debt. Her associate says, let's become a public corporation and sell stock to get increased funds. Another associate says that they will submit the application to become public with the state government, not the federal government, to receive a charter, which outlines the objective, structure, and plans for a corporation. And once approved, the company will become a legal corporation. So fast forward one year. The initial public offering takes place, and the shares of the company are sold to investors for cash. And this process is actually very costly, as there are a lot of legal and accounting processes involved. So that's why not that many companies become a public corporation. Here we see this new stock owner that was able to purchase shares in our fictional company. In addition to voting on important issues at annual meetings, stockholders have other benefits. Stockholders have the right to receive dividends. Um, those are the paid outs from a company when they're profitable. And in the event of liquidation, stockholders share, according to their percentage ownership, in any remaining assets after creditors are paid. Existing shareholders may also be given the first chance to buy newly issued shares of stock before it is offered to others. A company stockholder's equity section of its balance sheet can include multiple items. Contributed capital reports the amount of capital the company received from investors' contributions, in exchange for the company's stock, of course. And for this reason, contributed capital represents paid-in capital, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Retained earnings reports the cumulative amount of net income earned by the company less the cumulative amount of dividends declared since the corporation was first organized. And a lot of people like to call this the savings account of a corporation. It's just the cumulative amount of net income over, over time. Treasury stock represents those shares that were previously owned by the stockholders but have now been acquired and are now held by the corporation. An accumulated other comprehensive loss and in income is a very high level advanced accounting topic, but basically it just reports unrealized gains and losses, which are temporary changes in the value of certain assets and liabilities the company holds. So that can be things like pensions or fluctuations in foreign currencies. Again, that's a very advanced topic. There are several terms related to stock that we need to understand first. Authorized shares are the maximum number of shares that can be issued to the public. The number of authorized shares is identified in the corporate charter of the corporation that is issued by the state. Authorized shares can be classified as either issued or unissued. Issued shares are authorized shares of stock that have been distributed to stockholders. Unissued shares are authorized shares of stock that have never been issued to stockholders. So here we see our issued shares. And the issued shares can be classified as either outstanding or treasury stock. Outstanding shares are shares that are currently owned by the stockholders. And treasury stock are the shares that were once owned by stockholders, but the corporation repurchased those shares in the stock market. And now the corporation is actually the owner of those shares. Common stock normally has what we call a par value, which is usually a very small amount, such as one cent per share. And par value is like an arbitrary amount assigned to each share of stock in the corporation's charter. Par value is not related in any manner to the market value, which is actually the selling price of a share of stock. Again, it's just like an arbitrary amount assigned to a share of stock that we kind of keep track of in our accounts. And in addition to par value stock, some states permit no par value common stock. When par value stock is issued for cash, the common stock account is credited for the par value of the common stock. Okay, so that's at par value. 
Remember that par value and market value are not related. The difference between the par value of stock and then the market value or what someone has paid for that stock, the difference between those two is credited to an additional paid in capital account. The same thing is true for preferred stock. The type of stock that entitles the holder to a fixed di beep, 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 beep. The same thing is true for what we call preferred stock. And preferred stock is just a type of stock that entitles the holder to a fixed dividend and whose payment takes priority over that of a common stock dividend. So it's just a more preferred stock than the common normal regular stock that is sold. And the same thing is true here. We see that in the, par the preferred stock account, only the par value goes into that account and anything over par goes into a paid in capital account. If there's no par value on the stock purchase, then it will all the proceeds from the stock sale will actually go to the stock account and none of it will go to the paid in capital account. So let's assume that one share of $5 par common stock is sold for $7 then the $5 of common stock will go to the common stock account and then the $2 over par will go to the paid in capital account. Together this is a total of a $7 increase to stockholders equity. If we were to take a look at the stockholders equity section of the balance sheet, we can solve for the number of shares of preferred stock issued by taking a look at the dollar value in that account and the par value per each stock. In this case, there's $104,000 in the preferred stock account, and we know that par was $20. So we can solve for the number of shares issued by dividing 104,000 by the par value, which is $20, to get 5,200 shares issued for preferred stock. Once the shares of stock are owned by the public, they may be bought and sold in the open market. So sales between just you and me or me and my neighbor outside on the open market. And such transactions actually do not involve a company or its accounting records. The millions of shares that are bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange each business day are examples of this type of transaction. There is no impact on the company. You may be wondering why we even have treasury stock or why a corporation would even want to have its own stock. Corporations often buy their own stock back in the market and they do this because they want to send a signal that they believe the shares are worth acquiring or to increase their shares needed to use in the acquisition of another company or maybe to increase the shares for use in employee stock option plans which is actually um, used a lot here in Houchins Industries and Bowling Green and then maybe to reduce the number of outstanding shares to increase the per share measures of earnings. And we'll take a look at a few ratios towards the end of this PowerPoint. Cash dividends are declared by the Board of Directors. And there's actually no legal obligation to declare a cash dividend. But once declared, there is a legal obligation to pay it. So most corporations that pay cash dividends usually pay them quarterly. To pay a cash dividend, a corporation must have two things. Obviously, they must have sufficient retained earnings to absorb that dividend without going into the negative, and then they have to have enough cash to actually be able to pay it out. Back to our fictional company. Here we see the board of directors have decided upon a dividend when the company has been profitable. A cash dividend involves four important dates, only three of which will actually require entries and the four dates are the date of declaration, the date of record, the date of payment, and then at the end of the year we'll close out our dividend account. The date of declaration is the date the directors declare the dividend. At this time a liability is created and must be recorded. The transaction would affect the accounting equation by increasing the liabilities account, dividends payable, and then decreasing stockholders' equity by the same amount to represent the dividends. The dividends account is a temporary account that is closed to retained earnings at the end of the year. The date of record is important because it is the date when the corporation determines the owners of record who will receive the dividend. So basically they're just drawing a line in the sand and saying, 
who owns our stock today. There's no entry required in the accounting records on this date. The date of payment is the actual date the corporation will pay the dividend to the stockholders who own the stock on the record date. This transaction would affect the accounting equation by decreasing the liabilities or the dividends payable so we no longer have an obligation to pay and then by decreasing the asset for cash because we've actually made a cash payment for those dividends. Before we close out our dividend account, recall the basic net income equation. The retained earnings is impacted by an increase from net income and then dividends are being deducted. We will want to subtract our dividend amount from our retained earnings at the end of the year. And that's what we see here. At the end of the accounting year, all temporary accounts, those were like the expenses and the net income, including dividends, are closed into the retained earnings account. This closing journal entry zeroes out the temporary account dividends by transferring its debit balance to its permanent home and retain earnings. And thus, dividends will become a balance of zero, and the retained earnings is decreased by the amount of the dividend account. Lastly, let's look at some financial ratios. Earnings per share is one of the most widely used ratios. It is calculated by dividing net income, less preferred dividends, by the average number of common shares outstanding. Now if there are no preferred dividends in a year, then we don't need to subtract anything, so don't get hung up on that. This will tell us the portion of a company's profit allocated to each outstanding share of common stock. Another widely used financial ratio is return on equity, which tells us the amount earned for each dollar invested by common stockholders. Return on equity is calculated by dividing net income, less any preferred dividends again, by the average common stockholder's equity. Again, if we don't have any preferred dividends that year, don't get hung up on that. It's okay, we don't need to subtract anything. The P.E. ratio is a measure of the value that investors place on a company's common stock. It is calculated by dividing the current stock price per share by the annual earnings per share. If a P.E. ratio is 20, then the ratio tells us that investors are willing to pay 20 times the current year's earnings per share of stock. And investors will use this to compare it against companies outside of the, of the same industry. That way they can know which one has the best value.